All right, thank you all for joining this panel today. I'm really excited to be hosting a panel on digital assets in the US. Um, we hosted a similar panel in China this summer with Barrel Elite, so I'm really inter interested to see how the, the conversation is different this year. So just um, a few things up front. This is an educational panel. We're going to kind of start from some basic concepts around digital assets and, and then go into some more advanced topics, um, not assuming that everybody is an expert in digital assets. Um, and we're really excited to have our panelists here today. Just a little disclaimer up front from our lawyers on the panel. Uh, we have two of them, so don't be scared. Um, so the, <laughs> the opinions stated are those of each speaker and not of their firms, and none of what is said by our panelists is, could be construed as legal or investment advice. Did I get that right? Yes. All good? Okay. All right, guys. So let's get started on um, digital assets. It's such a broad topic, but um, we're really excited to have so many um, great experts here with us. What I'd like to do is have our panelists do very quick very quick bios on themselves, and we can start with Sean. Hello, my name's Sean Anderson. I'm an associate at a law firm of Sherman and Sterling. Uh, my day to day, I tend to focus on two things one being derivatives, trading documentation, and post uh, uh, crisis regulatory reform, as well as digital assets and blockchain. Uh, you can tell the latter is why I'm here today. So. Hi. Uh Hi, I'm Ksenia Sussman. I'm a general counsel at Biduda, and uh, we are a digital assets brokerage firm um, handling all aspects of trading, uh, brokering digital assets. Uh, before Biduda, I spent 11 years at Barclays handling a wide variety of investment banking activities. Hi, I'm Mike McGlone with um, Bloomberg Intelligence. I'm a commodity and crypto strategist, and Bloomberg Intelligence is the research arm of Bloomberg. Hi, I'm Adil Abdulali, President and Chief Science Officer of Protege Partners and Move 37. Um, I've been essentially sourcing and training and starting and seeding hedge funds for 16 years at Protege Partners. And we got into the digital asset space uh, sort of accidentally in 2015 when we funded the Digital Currency Initiative out of MIT. By the way, the DCI has a great website, has all kinds of wonderful information on it. And uh, we started uh, investing in these strategies uh, right, about, right about then and had some early successes with Polychain and Numerai. And uh, so now my focus is to try and do a uh, multi-strat for cryptocurrencies. Great, thank you so much. And I'd like to just um, preface our, our audience to, you know, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to get questions ready to go. I'd love to be able to entertain some questions from our audience. So getting started, I'd love to have um, Sanya talk about, kind of set the stage for us on digital assets. What do we, what do we mean by digital assets? It, it's such a broad term and can be misconstrued in a lot of different ways. So I'd love to have you kind of set the stage for us a little bit. Awesome, I'd love to do that. Um, so digital assets is effectively a digital representation of a particular set of value um, that is recorded on a blockchain. And it's important that it's recorded on a blockchain because blockchain effectively creates an almost, we want to call an immutable record of a particular transfer. Why is this important? It's important because, let me just give it a quick example. If I were to send a picture, let's say, of my dog to Suzanne and tell her, hey, for $50, you can have a picture of my dog, and I email it to her, and she gives me $50, and then I go ahead and send a picture to 100 other people, and they all send me $50. They all think they have a unique value. Blockchain change that all. Now on the blockchain, we're able to transfer a particular set of digitized value and know, um, have a proof of um, uh, crypto record effectively uh, of, of that particular value, right? So that's important, right? So on, on the blockchain, um, it uses cryptography to effectively state that, okay, 
this particular block, it creates this value, the next value, the next value, and um, at the end of the day, we can go back and see exactly which value was created, right? So there are different types of um, digital assets. Some of them, um, such as very well-known Bitcoin, that is particular sort of a currency, right? So it has a store of value, um, and, and that there's an economic, we can <laughs> have our economists like speak why people value it, but effectively that's, that's a store of value. So you can transfer that Bitcoin and you know when I transfer now to Suzanne my Bitcoin, she knows that she's got that particular amount of Bitcoin. Um, there are other um, asset classes as well. Some of them are utilities. So think of it sort of like your airline miles, right? Like you can have a blockchain that effectively utilizes particular technology to give you um, a set of, say, miles or whatever that may be, right, that you can use on that platform, right? Um, and finally, and most excitingly, um, you can have uh, a securities product. So, so basically, you probably, uh, hopefully, heard of ICOs, which was a big, big thing uh, in 2017, lots of billions of amounts of money have been raised um, in, uh, in this initial coin offerings. And um, surprisingly, somehow people didn't think there was securities, even though it sounds like IPO, but you know, what do I know? I'm, you know, I'm just a lawyer. Um, <laughs> so um, effectively, those products were considered to be securities under the SEC, so they fall within that jurisdiction. So. Long story short, um, you can have the digitized representation of value that could be a commodity, could be a utility, or, or it could be a security. Excellent, that's a good synopsis of topics that we have day-long conferences about, so <laughs> that's great. Um, so the reason why we have so many lawyers is this, this industry requires a lot of documentation. It has a lot of legal issues around it. Sean, I'd love to get a, just a little like high level, to kind of set the stage for our audience about some of the legal issues involved um, that we all hear about at kind of crypto conferences. Happy to. Sure. So you're all very familiar with Bitcoin, or, or at least that's what you may have read about in the news. And, and that kind of brought the idea of a digital asset to the fore in 2008 when it was uh, when it was introduced via the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, uh, the, the, the ethos behind Bitcoin was this notion of disintermediating traditional central trusted actors, being governments, banks. Uh, uh, what Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that may be, wanted to do is create a currency that people could uh, use to transact online directly with one another, and the strength of the uh, Bitcoin itself de was derived from the network. Uh, it, as you may understand, it was not really developed with uh, existing regulations in mind, particularly financial service regulations. And, and so what we currently have is, is a, a very complicated legal environment, particularly in the US, with respect to determining what you can do with assets and, and how you can transact with them and what, you can, uh, what type of activities you can engage in. I think a, a good way to think about it is kind of separating it into two areas of law. One is, if you're, if you're thinking about an asset itself, uh, like a Bitcoin, and, and I think Sinia set this up perfectly, uh, what is that asset under existing regulations? Is it a security? If it's a security, then it would be subject to potential registration under the Securities Act and other limitations on what you can do with it, depending on the role that you play. Uh, and, and what's a security? Is per SEC canon, there's a Howey test, which is, uh, it, it's, a, a contract, which is essentially uh, an investment in the common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits derived from the efforts of others. Um, that, that's not a very uh, a clear definition for market participants, but, but that is what we're working with. If, if you happen to fall outside of that, then you may be a commodity, which is, which is the other major federal uh, classification for, for digital assets, and that would be something that would fall under the CFTC's jurisdiction, uh, which is, which is a, a more limited jurisdiction than what you would think of with securities. Uh, but, but even setting that aside, once you determine what the asset is, you still have to consider, uh, I guess, what you'll be doing, where you'll be doing it, who you'll be doing it with, 
and, and how you'll be doing it, because you have to determine whether or not uh, any of a panoply of federal regulators could, could have some interest in what you're engaging in. Uh, to the extent you're uh, exchanging virtual currencies for one another or for, for fiat dollars, uh, FinCEN may have an interest in what you're doing. You may need to register as a money services business. To the extent you're, you're providing a platform for global citizens to engage in transactions, OFAC may want to make sure that you're complying with U.S. sanctions laws. So it's, it's really, uh, and, and I think you may laugh, but, but when you come to a lawyer and you say, what am I doing? Is it allowed? How can I do this? The question really is, uh, the answer will be it depends. And, and it's going to depend on, and, and, and ex like, exactly like I said, it'll depend on who you are, what you're doing, where you're doing it, and how you're going to do it. And you really need to undertake that on a on a point by point basis, uh, just based on on uh, on your plans. And in and, and that kind of standpoint, you need to look at it. Even if you're just an investor thinking about investing in an enterprise, or if you're a proprietor, an entrepreneur thinking about starting an enterprise, or or if you're thinking about funding one. I mean, you really need to think about these questions to make sure that what you're doing won't be subject to undue regulatory risk down the road. So. And, and don't forget the tax regulations. I'm not a tax lawyer, so I don't know much about it, but I know that <laughs> that IRS definitely has a particular treatment of so, crypto assets. So every government agency gets gets their gets their hands in this. Everybody yes. gets, gets everybody their hands gets a piece in of this. And and to Cynthia's point yeah. on the IRS, when Bitcoin Cash came out, which was a hard fork off Bitcoin, we may get into the the technicals of that. Uh, tax lawyers were considering whether or not Bitcoin Cash was similar to a a CAF that was based on historic tax law, looking at what happens when a cow gives birth, or if it was a stock split. And that was a legitimate discussion. The IRS just came out with guidance, but, but it kind of shows that, that all the agencies really are involved. A lawyer at a firm will work on one aspect, but lawyers across that firm and every practice group are gonna be looking at some aspect of digital assets. So. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that a little bit um, further as we talk about how regulators are engaged in this space. It seems like they're quite um, engaged. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit to the business side. And Adele, I'd love to hear kind of why are you involved in this space? What's the business case for digital assets? And how did you get involved? In, what might our audience, how, how they might think about sort of the business side of, of the digital asset space. Okay, well, uh, let me ask, who does not own any Bitcoin at all? You can be honest. So there's a few people, actually quite a few, who don't own any Bitcoin at all. So let me say this, that the entire uh, information, market, everything about Bitcoin is 10 years old. So there are no experts in the space. So you could be an expert in no time just by reading a bunch of stuff, um, but you wouldn't be an expert because it's evolving. So let me tell you how this thing started as far as buying Bitcoins, because if you can go out and buy a Bitcoin right now, and it's really like, you know, here's a wallet, right? It's my wallet. It's got dollars in it. How did I get the dollars? You know, often you go to an ATM machine. Well, um, could we have the... Uh, Picture. I have a picture of an ATM machine, if they can get it up. But while they get it up, let me tell you what that picture is. Uh, about two blocks from here on 32nd Street, uh, there's a kind of 7-Eleven type store with a Bitcoin ATM run by CoinShares. You can go there, put in a couple of dollars, and buy your Bitcoin. Instead of going into your wallet, right, you can put it onto this. This is a Bitcoin wallet. It's like a little hard drive. Because what is a Bitcoin? It's just the record of what you own. And you have your key on this thing. If you lose this, if I lose this, I lose all my Bitcoin. That's why they call it digital gold. I mean, gold, if you have it, you know, you can put it under your mattress, you can put it in somewhere. People can steal it, people can steal this. If they steal this hardware wallet, it doesn't matter. They still can't get it unless they have my cryptocurrency code to get that money. So I got interested in this money aspect uh, a while ago. And then Bitcoin came along and it became like a tradable, you know, investable asset. Uh, it turns out that now anyone can get Bitcoin anywhere in the world by, you know, the best way is to start a Coinbase account and, and uh, you know, basically buy some. 
And then, of course, every quantitative trader, every person who was a computer scientist started to trade Bitcoin. And so we started to see strategies evolve about what to do with not just Bitcoin, but the other cryptocurrencies that were in the uh, ecosystem. It also turned out that you know, Bitcoin is just one version of a blockchain, one use case of a blockchain. That's use cases money as a store of value. There could be others that's money as a transaction, transactional type of thing. But there are also features of the blockchain that make it very, very useful for other sorts of uh, activities that involve networks of people agreeing on things. So there's a, in finance, there's a very interesting case right now. So if you uh, guys know about you know, when the financial crisis happened in 2008 and Lehman Brothers failed, part of what the regulators were looking at to, to kind of uh, bail it out was that the derivative swap notional value there was $400 billion worth of derivative notional. And they got really scared about that, and they had to do something about it, and so they saved Lehman Brothers. You know, five, six years later, after going through all the details, what they figured out was the actual net amount at risk between all the counterparties was only $9 billion. They could have not done that, and the $9 billion would have been fine. Now, why did they not know this information? Because that information was stored bilaterally between all the different players in the swap market, and so nobody could know what was going on. There was no transparency. Believe it or not, if that swap contracts had been on a blockchain type thing where everyone can look into it and see what's going on instantly, it would have been much, much clearer that the exposure was much less than it could be. So that's another very useful financial use case of a blockchain. That blockchain has not been built yet. It's in progress. Uh, in fact, the former chairman of the CFTC, who effectively uh, was very much behind introducing the first Bitcoin futures contracts in 2017, is also very firmly behind that effort. That's really interesting, Noah. I, when you were talking about the swaps market during the financial crisis, I had, had, had very physical, like, just reaction to that. Having been in the middle of that and trying to... Uh, get rid of some trades in the middle of the financial crisis. I oh. recall that. Yeah, so here, here's, your, here's your ATM. Yeah, so that's, just uh, a couple blo that's just a couple blocks from here. You can go there and you can, you can buy your there, first anyway. Bitcoin. <laughs> and you can buy chips and you can buy you know, a Slurpee <laughs> <laughs> along with it. Um, not, and not to be a downer, but one of the things, when I was doing research for this panel, I asked a lot of very senior level people across major institutions around their comfort level with digital assets and they don't a lot of them don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole these are you know very very well-known firms who take a lot of risk in a lot of things what would you say to large institutional investors uh, big pe firms big asset managers who are really just quite fearful of getting getting their their brand associated with digital assets so my view on this is, is maybe a little bit controversial. I would tell them, uh, my, my, my sort of understanding is that this market, the entire cryptocurrency market is $300 billion. So uh, it's not a large market. So you know, there are several institutions that could buy up that entire market easily and, and you know, still have dollars left over. So it really isn't an institutional type market yet. What I would tell those people to do is to go to the coin shares machine and buy Bitcoin. So I think it's very much like a private thing right now for small groups, small asset managers, small entities. It's not for the CalPERS and CalSTRS of the world just yet. It has to grow a lot before it gets there. It is a very new asset class. It is scary. It's just a piece of software. Software has bugs, and they're working out the bugs all the time. You know, they don't, it seems to be pretty bug free as far as Bitcoin, because it hasn't failed yet. There's been no hacking of Bitcoin. It's completely pure. The only things that have been hacked that you've probably heard about are these wallet type things where you store your Bitcoin. So think about gold has never been hacked, right? You can't take gold and do something to it or, or destroy it. But it can be stolen. That's what Bitcoin is. No one, no one has actually changed Bitcoin or, or made the software break. But where you've stored your Bitcoin, they've they've broken into that vault and run away with it. So that's, that's, that's one of the uh, problems. Now, custody is a problem. There's a lot of these things that are problems. They're being solved very quickly. I would say to whoever is, uh, you know, has control, 
of a large amount of assets and has money, whoever solves some of the custody problems, starts some of these asset management firms right now, in 15 years, they'll be sitting very, very pretty because they'll have a technology and a, and a sort of install base that nobody will be able to touch. So it's very scary right now. I would do it personally, definitely, and then start putting some effort into institutionalizing it, but in a slow, methodical way. So with the uh, introduction of physically settled Bitcoin futures, we have cash settled Bitcoin futures, custody solutions are coming out day to day. Do you have an idea or would you be willing to put a, uh, an estimate on maybe when it'll become a more institutional market? Or I know you said 15 years, but... Well, I, I think that right now, j just looking at Bitcoin, I think there's like 35 or 40 million wallets. Um, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world. I, I, I think, you know, once it becomes in the billions, then it'll become in institutionalized and be able to support that type of activity. The volatility will shrink a lot at that point. And I think things like uh, Libra and Facebook, that, that whole of thing, large networks is what you need for these things to become stable. And it's not clear that, of course, that anyone trusts Facebook's large net network, et cetera. We'll get into that perhaps. But that's what it will take. And so it's growing very quickly. I, I think that... Um, you know, these things, financial innovation and these types of things, uh, somebody said uh, recently, I'm trying to remember who, so it's not, I didn't say this, so I don't want to take credit, was that, you know, techn technologically driven uh, innovation, you know, always seems too slow looking forward, that, oh Gates. my God, and it's uh, always looking backwards, like, oh my God, that happened really fast. That was Bill Gates. Huh? Okay. Bill Gates said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if I may chime in, um, Adila, maybe Mike can uh, shed a little bit of light on that. What we are also seeing is derivative products uh, on, on Bitcoin, such so as the mining companies, you know, hedging their exposure towards the rising prices or the falling prices, uh, more probably falling prices of the Bitcoin, um, as well as hedging, um, obviously, the exposure to sort of electricity and utilizing uh, alternative energy sources. I mean, what, what do you, how do you see that market being developing from, from the business perspective? Active. Well, I mean, the derivatives thing was, again, you know, Bitcoin derivatives, the futures market was introduced to dampen the volatility, uh, the sort of the spike bubble in 2017. The same chairman of the CFTC, um, Giancarlo somebody, um, uh, you know, he was part of the CFTC and the CME in 2017 when Bitcoin prices were going to the moon. And they very purposely came up with the idea that if you were to make a futures market come out at that time, and in fact, the first futures were traded in November, December 2017, with the complete backing of the regulators, so that people could take the short side, because that's what futures do. And that they, they, the theory was that it would cut the bubble and, and make it more rational. In fact, that's what they did. Now, you know, two years later, just a recent study by some professor, which is reported in Bloomberg actually, was that 50%, so, so the futures vo volume in Bitcoin is already 50% of the cash Bitcoin market. That's a lot right now within two years. And as most asset classes, eventually probably futures will be larger than the cash market. Um, so I think it's gonna grow by leaps and bounds. As far as you know, futures, taking short sight of things, it's very important to have lending markets. And lending has, has started out in um, Bitcoin and probably 15 other cryptocurrencies. So as far as true trading strategies, as you know, arbitrage strategies where you can buy one thing, sell the other thing, and not take the kind of the cryptocurrency risk as much, uh, that thing is just becoming possible in the last two years. When we first invested in our, um, in, in a, the first cryptocurrency fund, it was called a hedge fund, but it was long only. There, there was not even a concept of, of shorting anything back then. You know, two years after that, there were already arbitrage strategies, exchange arbitrages where, you know, you can take sing pairs of cryptocurrencies and, and trade them in different exchanges. And there's all kinds of risks involved with that, counterparty risk, you know, execution risk. Exchanges go down. There's no, there's a lot of sort of weird actors in this space, but there's a lot of money to be made. I mean, these arbitrage strategies, when other hedge funds are really struggling, are, you know, making 50, 60, 70% annualized returns but of course with very little assets at the moment. So again, it needs to grow before they can become big. So still very, very small. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the typical okay. cryptocurrency arbitrage hedge fund ends up 
running five to ten million dollars at the most. Okay. Uh, you know, that's not what hedge fund scale is about. <laughs> all right, all right. So moving on, I'd love to to give um, some time to to our friend Mike from Bloomberg. Um, love reading your stuff on Bloomberg about crypto. One, tell our audience where they can find your stuff um, on Bloomberg under Bloomberg Machines, and two, give us a little lens into the the kind of market level understanding of Bitcoin, especially. Okay, so I, I write for Bloomberg, so everything's on for Bloomberg terminal users. I also post Clifto versions on my website, and also we, we publish a monthly crypto outlook, which I think I sent you a copy of, and everybody can get that, just Google Bloomberg crypto outlook, and it usually comes out a day, or sometimes the afternoon after I publish on the terminal. But I think I need to change the subject real quick, so let's do the math here. I see an exit sign, and I see maybe a million dollars worth of Bitcoin here. So what would you do? I'm out of here. But that's the th key thing that struck me about you know, getting addicted to this space as a trader, as a commodity guy, ex-pit trader, been in New York for 25 years from Chicago. Is there's, it's, I look at Bitcoin like gold. There's 118 elements, commodities, and there's only one gold. It's the most unique element on Earth. Can't replicate it, can't duplicate it. It's, it's gold, it's the biggest stash in the world. It's right down the street of the Federal Reserve for a reason. Um, Bitcoin's the same thing cryptos. There's three, as I checked on CoinMarketCap, right, this morning, there's 3,100 cryptocurrencies. Most of them are just a gaggle. Um, the copycats, and there's one Bitcoin. It's won the battle of store value in a digital way. And it's that concept that Abdul brought out to be able to move your value, your currency, anything from any place in the world on a thumb drive, China, Venezuela, India, 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 um, in um, Turkey, any place you, you, that has a capital controls or depreciation currencies. So that's the way I've been looking at Bitcoin since I've really been um, analyzing it. And to me, that's the key thing that's happening this year. The market's getting it that Bitcoin's digital gold and the rest of the market, as we measure at Bloomberg, the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, which is this another 10, which is basically 98% of the whole market. The rest are just so many copycats. Um, is that whole market space is just trying to catch up to Bitcoin, which is the leader and it should continue to be the leader. And I think it's gonna continue that way. So I look at it, um, just by looking at the panel, we have lawyers. We have, a, as you mentioned earlier, we have adults in the room. Didn't have adults in the room in this space in the past. So people say, oh, you know, past performance is not indicative of future returns. Absolutely not. One thing I can virtually guarantee is volatility in the space should continue to plunge. So one good example, 180-day volatility and Bitcoin is running around 70, 80%. The low was 41% in October 2015, which marked the big bull market that ended in 2017. So volatility in commodities typically goes up when markets break out. Bitcoin's done with that for now. There's gonna be a lot of residual sellers up, a lot of responsive buyers on the downside. So I look at it stuck within a range between 8,000 and 12,000 for quite a while. Volatility should continue to collapse as it transmogrifies into a digital version of gold. And a lot of that's futures, derivatives. They're only, I look at it as a former options market maker. I'd love to be able to make markets in this space. Here's my bid, here's my offer. Hedge it in the middle, you know, square up my Greeks and you make, and there's people making it and they're doing that more and more. An ETF's gonna come, it's a matter of time. And I think the best way to do this is just have an ETF track to futures. There's significant, I mean listed futures. There's significant liquidity and volume. They're gonna be trading options next year. I used to be in those, trade those options. And so to me, that's where it's going. And what can make it fail? I don't know yet, but this year it's been the macro really kicking in, plunging bond yields, just what's driving gold price up should be supporting the, the Bitcoin price. I can pass it back yeah, to you. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. The, um, I, was, I was interested when I was reading your article about kind of the range in which Bitcoin has kind of been sitting in. And I'd love to get a sense from you Kind of what the what kind of what the dynamics play out at above those levels or below those levels? Um, what kind of actors or what kind of behaviors exist? You know, beyond those, well, behind first, those ranges, is what, that is that what you're seeing? Is kind yeah. of what where normal behavior exists? Yeah. Well, one thing about Bloomberg is intentionally not first in the space, and I've heard that from senior because it's we have very adult supervised data people, and so the data in here is just dicey. I mean, CoinMarketCap.com. We went to them and tried to look at their data. They wanted an enormous amount of money, and it's one guy in an apartment in 
Long Island someplace. I'm like, uh, that doesn't work for us. So I look for indications I can find of supply, demand, and price. As a commodity guy, what really is where I'm seeing? So currently, I see a lot of indicators there's going to be more and more bids below the market. Transactions. Um, one of the highest correlation things I can find, I find that in um, coin metrics. Um, addresses used, things like that, volatility, anything I can look at that has a robust indicator. So I see bids blown off, I'm hearing about it, I'm seeing it. Abdul, I've seen from people I, I know in the business, they're looking to buy because they get it. It's the risk of, okay, one or two percent of my assets. Now this is westernized dollar money. I mean, I'm thinking the rest of the world too that doesn't have the adult currency we have. Um, in, in an asset that is going to be, it's very limited in supply, like nothing else exists and it's just won the space. So I see that as bids below and then anything that really rallies up to around 15,000, 16,000, massive amount of residual overhang, hangover sell, uh, sellers from the people who bought, you know, way too high during the frenzy in 2000 and um, in um, 17. But so I look at right now as very simply as a strategy, it's simply retracing the bear market. It's nothing new, nothing exciting. It gets above 20,000, that's going to be exciting. I don't see that for a while. Just like gold. Gold gets above 1,900, that's going to be exciting. It will do that. It's just a question of time. It's done in the euro. It's done in, in, uh, in the British pound, just a matter of time. So to me, it's very similar. And I get sometimes a lot of pushback from the pure crypto guys. Oh, why are you looking at it like gold? I'm like, because it is. It's a digital version of gold. And there's that book by Nathaniel Popper. Um, it's really laid it out. Digital goal. No, thank you so much. Um, it's, real, it's really helpful to read your stuff in Bloomberg. It's very educational. Highly recommend people take a look at it. Um, and we always see in, in the digital asset space, we always see a lot of lawyers. So I'd love to dig in a little bit deeper. Sean, you were um, starting to talk a little bit about some of the kind of legal regulatory issues that have popped up in in not to put our audience to sleep, but just some of like the latest and greatest um, things in this space, because we all we all we all see it's kind of a moving target. Every event I go to with regulators and digital asset folks, they just want clarity. And are we going to get clarity? Is it ever coming? And who's involved? And in, and in where is that? Where do you think that's going to go? So that's a fantastic question. I think. Uh, Looking at the U.S. in terms of a regulatory environment as compared to other countries, your U.K., your Singapore, it's a bit more decentralized than the way we approach regulation here. We don't have one fintech regulator. We don't have one digital asset regulator that everyone can look to for clear guidance. Uh, you really need to pay attention uh, in your particular area to all the regulators that could apply. And, and, and for a while, that's been, that's been difficult. Um, it's... it's uh, the regulators have each taken their own amount of time to come to a position on how to, uh, to, to accommodate digital assets and how to reflect them in the regulatory framework. But what I will say that's been great in the last year, year and a half, is that all of the U.S. regulators are paying attention. They're all working on uh, uh, policies. They're all working on regulatory uh, uh, updates. In particular, I think I mentioned tax. Uh, the IRS just came out with an interpretation uh, uh, with respect to how to accommodate hard forks. If you get a currency after a hard fork, is that a basis event? Yes, it is. Uh, there are, the SEC recently came out with a no action letter in respect of turnkey jet, uh, looking at when an ICO is not a security. Some would say it's not very helpful, it's not the most realistic of, of characteristics, but it is, the SEC is thinking about it. They're grappling with it. They're they're making public announcements of of ways forward. Uh, the CFTC, of course, is is constantly coming out uh, with with uh, thoughts and 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 with with policies with respect to how to look at digital assets as commodities. Is Bitcoin is Ether a commodity? Are they security? I think Ether. They most recently came out with in a speech and said yes, Ether is a, a commodity and not a security, which promptly led to a bit more comfort in the market with respect to Ether transactions. You didn't have to worry about the SEC coming out and saying, whoa, 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 all your transactions are in an unregistered security. We're going to freeze it and 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 thus endangering your investment. Um, FinCEN uh, coming out with with uh, money services business regulations regarding what you should do if you're engaging in transacting or, or exchanging virtual currency. When when are you caught by the rules and what do you have to do in a very clear release? So it's it's been uh, I think a trying 
three to four years, but we've seen a, la a lot of progress in the last year and a half. And, and I don't know if you guys have seen it. In, yeah, in I'd love Sean, to get the, the a, people who are yeah. kind of in the business on their perspective with the regulated regulatory Sean, engagement. Yeah, I just wanted to mention yeah. a little bit of like a practical sort of thing, just because we are a digital asset broker, right? So for us, in order to know what is it that we're brokering, we are um, a registered uh, introducing broker under CFTC. So that falls obviously within the commodities jurisdiction. Uh, we also have um, a broker dealer under the SEC. So I think like one of the just the practical things that we lawyers need to understand is like how how to um, effectively analyze um, the particular digital asset and know which kind of asset it is because then you know which jurisdiction you're going to fall into and which particular entity that that you um, that you, you have to effectively follow those regulations. So I think like um, understanding the the framework and and analyzing that particular asset to to bucket into like the right bucket is is extremely important. And I think in in respect of uh, of ether um, that's speech was at a Yahoo conference, I think, um, and that basically opened up a room to effectively say, okay, something that could have been an ICO, could have been a security, and now it is not a security anymore. So that, I feel like that's one of the interesting points to kind of think about and, uh, on, on the back of the mind, just because something can morph from a security into a commodity. How? I don't know, but but, but that's <laughs> it's I mean possible. that's an example of the SEC really thinking about applying the Howey test. I don't think to date we've seen the idea of a security being a security on day one and slowly morphing to the to the case where the network is sufficiently decentralized. It's no longer security, but that's that's a novel interpretation to accommodate digital assets. Yeah. Uh, Sean, like let, let me ask you a question. With the newer ones, like there's coins that would represent a security and even an asset of some sort it's pretty clear that the SEC and all of those people get involved. But right. how, much is that the, how much is that the regulators just got was too far behind the eight ball in Bitcoin's case? Because Bitcoin is a currency. It was illegal to make another currency other than the dollar, right? You, you can't just make up your own currency. That's, they just won't allow it. But it's, it's already there, and it's, we're not, they can't do anything about it. So it's kind of outside the purvey, Bitcoin itself, of the regulators, isn't it? Well, so I think you're, you're right to point out it's, it's, I think, generally accepted it's not a security, so you don't need to worry about securities regulations. It's not a legal tender accepted by the U.S. government, so it's not your traditional concept of a, of a fiat currency. But it is a, a, a method of exchange in the same way that I think you could look at physical commodities like gold. Uh, and, so, and so that's where it's key that the regulators come out with a, a, a clear delineation of what falls under their purview and what doesn't. With Bitcoin, it was very helpful that the CFTC came out early and said, we think Bitcoin is a security. And the SEC came out in their Dow report and, 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 and more or less confirmed that they agreed that it wasn't a security, they think it's a commodity. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, that's where a lot of it is. I think uh, the CFTC is gonna pick up a lot of the slack when we're outside of the security space. And there you'll have prohibitions on fraudulent and manipulative conduct. Uh, there you'll have uh, regulations in respect of derivatives and, and, and on those, uh, those types of, of assets. And, and you'll have it under the standard commodities framework that we've used to date. So. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so moving on to maybe a happy topic of the future of digital assets. I'd love to give our panelists a little bit of time to talk about from their perspective, where, where are we going? Um, if we're here a few years from now, wh where do you think we'll be? Mike, do you want to start? I, thank you. I'd like to start with the picture that Bill brought up. Um, the, the concept of Bitcoin ATM is a novelty. And I learned this from, number one, you can, they do have these things for gold in Asia, and, um, but they're novelties. The commission that they charge, you want to be in the sell side of that trade. The, uh, the ATM provider, because they charge up to 10% typically for buying and selling Bitcoin. I mean, you would know better than I, but I remember reading some of these guys at conferences. I'm like, really? I want to be in your business. For uh, the rest of us... By the way, you can get an ATM license and start that. It's very Boom. easy, actually. Exactly. They want you to do that, and you can make that 7% spread yourself. Well, be on that side, of, that, be on that side of the trade, <laughs> as I like to teach my kids when I always want to buy things. Be on the sell side of that trade. There are regulatory burdens associated well, with Well, yeah, I'll, that's why they hire you. the lawyer in the room. But so I look at it as um, Bitcoin's never, I don't think, ever going to be used to buy and sell a cup of coffee. And it shouldn't be because it's, well, we, you need to have virtually zero volatility. Like the U.S. trade weighted broad dollar is that volatility is like 5%. 
versus other currencies. That makes sense for a, uh, a, a medium of exchange. Tether, to me, is potential for a medium exchange. It's, it, it tracks the dollar. It's the most successful um, stable coin. And guess what Libra is trying to do? It just wants to be another Tether. Tether's already won. So I look at Bitcoin as like gold. You're supposed to be accumulating as an investment when it looks undervalued. And, maybe lighten up when it's overvalued, but put it in a portfolio. That's for us. And in this country is a, a Wences Caceres. We might have heard of me as a, the Venezuelan um, internet, Argentina, I'm sorry, entrepreneur, entrepreneur. He said, for Americans, money is like water is to a fish. Um, and so for us, it's, I think, of the rest of the world who needs to hold some diversified portfolio value of their their currency. It's going there for digital. I, and I, the way I like to describe it is put ourselves 10 years in the future, unless you think technology is going backwards and the world is going to you know, become less digitalized, you got to expect cryptocurrencies to really exceed. And I say cryptocurrency, I should say crypto assets because most of them are just speculative digital assets. But Bitcoin to me is, the rest of them I don't really know. There's going to be some way I should be able to transact that's low cost on some kind of global scale maybe with Bitcoin, with the Lightning Network, but I look at that as unless that volatility is near zero, why would I buy or sell it? I'm just gonna trade it. I'm not gonna use it to buy a piece of clothing. You need something that's stable, and that's what the market doesn't get yet. I think it's getting, and that's why the other 3,100 have problems until they can form some stability. I think Bitcoin's doing it organically. Oh, that's great. Adil, where, well, where are we going? It's, it's, I know you're, you're the... Uh, you're the, the fancy math guy, so but I, don't I want make, you to throw some math at me. That's why I do arbitrage strategies. The direction is completely immaterial. But uh, for Bitcoin itself, I think as far as the store of value, if Mike is right and it becomes more and more accepted like gold, I mean, gold has several trillion dollars in market value, and Bitcoin has like 180, million, 180 billion. So it has a long way to go if people start storing their, some of their wealth in Bitcoin as well. It is very useful for you know, weird places where you have to flee, because I mean, it's a lot easier to flee with this than bags of gold. Um, and in fact, you, know, you don't even need that. If you can memorize your cryptocurrency key in your head, then you could be, have your billion dollars in your head and ac access it anywhere, and nobody can get it from you in any way other than you know, becoming a mind reader. So it's, it's much more transportable than gold. So there's some well, argument there. What if you there. die? What do you die? So what if you there die? was a, there was a, that's uh, that's, very that's recently, I was thinking about that. About there was that very again. recently, yeah. there was a, uh, there was mysterious, a gentleman. Mysterious there was a, death. Yeah, there was a, well, there's a gentleman who passed away um, and he had a hundred, well, not that much, $156 million in Bitcoin uh, and he hadn't told anyone his keys. So they're gone. Nobody has them. That's, They'll never find them. Well, that's the a good example thing. of the scarcity. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, they're just, they're, it's, they're going to stop mining these. In what is it? Twelve years? They're just going to be gone with yeah. supply. And Bitcoin's won. So there's no other thing that exists like that. That, and there's so much lost on a daily basis. It's just maybe they'll find some of it. So that's on the Bitcoin currency side. On the other blockchain type projects like Ethereum and Monero, and there's a whole bunch of them that that you refer to. You know, these are early days. I mean, Bitcoin is only 10 years old and it still hasn't come off. These other ones started, you know, probably four or five years ago. And the technology is really not there yet. It's just being worked out. The problems, the economic problems that are being solved are some of the problems that I, for example, the swap transparency problem. Uh, there's credit information problems out there that could be solved with this distributed ledger technologies. There's, there's a lot of problems that are very, much in the middle of being solved now. And I see it like a J curve. There's lots of stuff percolating. And there's a lots of nonsense. I mean, part of the reason why this got a really bad uh, sort of press and all that was in 2017, when there was a bubble, there were a lot of charlatans who could just come up with any crazy idea and they raised a lot of money, but they had nothing to show for it. I, I think after the bust in 2018, now there's a lot more mature projects, but they're going slowly. And uh, as soon as one of them has a success, you'll see some other very successful projects come out of it. So I think in That's five great. years, it will be much more accepted so in a everyone, lot of places. So everyone's grandma is going to have a, a wallet? Yeah, and saying? actually, you know, Mike was right. Do not do this. Um, th this was kind of a uh, harking back to the days when in 2012, when we were buying Bitcoin, there wasn't no CoinShares ATM. You actually had to go to the 7-Eleven 
you had to call on the immigrant phone, what they call the immigrant phone, which is not, you know, not traceable. And some, some guy in another country would pick up and promise to send you Bitcoin. Then you handed over cash to the 7-Eleven person and then hope. And sometimes the Bitcoin showed up, sometimes it didn't. That, that was when it was really risky. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'd like to give our audience some opportunities to, answer, to ask some questions. So Val, if you could get some likes, please feel free. No, no question is, is too silly. This is a, uh, a very interesting topic, but there's a lot of technicalities. So feel free. Any questions in the room? I'm probably not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm here from Intoro Capital, and we publish a quarterly newsletter of STOs. So you can go to IntoroCapital.com and sign up for that. This was a really fun panel about the Wild West days, but that's history. Um, we're moving forward on digital instruments every day. We have clients um, you know, that we're in discussions with uh, about all kinds of different new offerings. And it, it exists today. It's happening. So sign up for our newsletter, and you can track it. Excellent. Anybody have, have a question for our panel? I'd love, while we're waiting for another question, um, quick lightning rounds. Libra, will it be here a year from now? What do you, what do you think? I don't think so. Very not in quick the state answers. that it is right now. <laughs> Certainly not in the state that it is right now. I think that there's a lot of issues with it currently. And uh, one of the things about Facebook, I think, is certainly like privacy issues that, that were of a whole lot of concern. Um, but I just wanted to say, like, just generally speaking, I think, you know, in terms of digital assets, um, it's, it's the technology here behind it that's the most important part. I think we really have to understand that, you know, in my little, you know, silly example of transferring to you, you know, picture of my dog, right? Now with this technology, we're able to cryptographically transfer value of a particular asset, whatever that may be, whether it's a Bitcoin or whether it's a digitized, you know, title to my car or title to my house or whatever that may be. I think that, you know, we need to not lose the sight of, of what the blockchain technology itself can bring. So it could be, you know, a digital asset that was, you know, originally born on, uh, on, on, on the blockchain, so to speak, um, as in uh, Bitcoin, but it could be something else. We could take gold and we could digitize effectively, you know, a title to a particular, you know, uh, amount of gold or, or it could be a barrel of oil or it could be it, it could be anything and I think that that's where the future is and I think that that's what that's gonna make it really exciting and and, and quickly oh. quickly Libra I want I, I want the answer to Libra uh, so that, I get this question every day people are always asking me so I'm like I have well, I have to ask my panel that, that's a hard question I mean I think the the timing may not have been the best uh, uh, being looked at for for privacy violations at the same time that you're trying to introduce a a major feature to your platform that would essentially allow for the creation or a collection of much more data uh, it, it just rung a few and the financial too many. data and financial data at that so it would kind of perfect the picture of the person that they already know quite well based on on their activities on Facebook uh, and and so I think maybe it just it wasn't the right time. The idea is still not necessarily a bad idea. I think we see that type of model in Asia, uh, where you can where you can engage in transactions via a messaging platform much more easily than you can here in the U.S. But yeah. So last you guys, uh, real give, quick, give me quick answers. The, well, the key thing about Libra for me is it's an indication of a significant trend in the business in the space towards stability because people are figuring out is that's what you need for an exchange of value. So I look at Libra as, I don't care if it succeeds or not, but from my view, it accentuates my view that Bitcoin's more likely to, to migrate towards a digital version of gold and the rest of the very volatile, highly speculative di digital assets will become less, with less valuable. Libra is just trying to be like Tether and Tether is a, a successful stable coin. All right, you get the uh, Libra will be word. there. Libra will be around okay. because uh, they have the hugest network known to man and some form of a digit, you know, sort of a distributed ledger right. that is a stable type thing will come out of it. How much Facebook will be involved? I don't know. It won't start in a year because it's going to take more than three years to work out the technology. But yeah, Libra will be around. All right. Thank you all. Oh, we have one question in the audience. I'm here. Okay, okay. Anyway, um, you've alluded to the distinction between Bitcoin and distributed ledger, blockchain technology. They're very different. Um, how would you recommend that a family office um, or um, an institution invest in this space? What percent of your assets in cryptocurrency, uncorrelated, highly volatile, what percent of your assets in 
fundamental software infrastructure, 5,000 years old, called um, distributed ledger or blockchain? 1%. That's my answer. That's uh, 1% okay. for which one? For total? Total. Yeah. yeah. And then take your pick. I mean, Morgan Creek says five, but they're ridiculous. So Yeah, because yeah, we're still in the first inning on all this stuff. There's still a lot. As you were talking about earlier, there's still, still a lot to be worked out, legal, regulatory, business side. So I'm very pro 1%. Yeah. Very against 0%. <laughs> yeah. But the 1%, it, it, you it, make no distinction between whether it should be in cryptocurrency or in distributed ledger technology? Which well, are, well, some of it has to be in Bitcoin. And then, then pick the others, because I have no idea which ones are going to succeed. No, neither does anybody else. And Bitcoin might fail as well. I mean, it's a software. There might be a bug. It hasn't been found yet. <laughs> but, but to his point, I mean, Bitcoin, the technology is here. We have the plane. The runway is being built. I mean, we're seeing custody solutions come out. We're seeing increased uh, exchange-traded derivatives coming out. It's, it's the more serious players that you get in the game, the less volatile it'll be. The more interest uh, is in, in the network, I mean, the more adoption. And it's really monetization of the network effect. So it's uh, whether or not Bitcoin is the vehicle, I think right now it's the... It's in the lead, but, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. So. It's in the lead because, I mean, you know, there's $200 billion to be stolen, and so everyone's trying to steal it. They haven't <laughs> succeeded. It's a pretty good pot of gold for people to compete for. <laughs> all right, guys. Um, thank you all so much for participating in our panel today. Um, if you have questions that you want to chat with our panelists about, please feel free. This is a really, we're in the first inning on digital assets, so... It's an, it's an exciting time to be on the ground floor. So thank you all so much for listening and to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, guys.